Let me show you how I would do it here. See this statement I want to prove. Okay, I want to have a look at that left hand side. Let's have a look at the left hand side and let's play with it. I want to try and interact with it in such a way so that I can simplify, simplify, work through it, use this piece of information which I've assumed to be true, and then see if I can get it in this form. Okay, so let's have a go. This is 7 to the power of k plus 1 minus 4 to the k plus 1 plus 2 is 3. Okay, so that's the left hand side of the statement I want to work with. Okay, now I want to use this fact. This fact here, right? Because I've assumed that it's true. I don't actually know it's true, but I'm just seeing what happens if it is. Okay? So in order to use that fact, I need to manipulate this so it looks more like this. Okay? Now, as an example, look at the first term. 7 to the k plus 1. What's the difference between 7 to the k plus 1 and 7 to the k? What's the difference between these two terms? It's, uh, it's, it's just the plus one, right? What, but it's in the index, so what does that mean? Yeah, sure, sure. Very good, it's multiplied by seven. The difference between whoop, seven squared and seven cubed is that this is seven times bigger. Do you agree? And you know, seven to the power of 12 and seven to the power of 13, this number is seven times bigger. Does that make sense? So I can rewrite this guy as seven times seven to the k. Does that make sense? Um, why is this helpful? Because it looks a little more like this. So I'm going to get closer to being able to use this. Okay. Now, what about this guy? Hmm. This guy is related to that one over there as well, right? What is the difference, humor me, I know it's very similar. What's the difference between this and this term? What's the difference? It's four times bigger. Just like this guy was seven times bigger, this one has an extra multiple of four, right? Uh, so therefore, I can write this as take away 4, lots of 4 to the k plus 2. Okay, so this is good. This is progress because it looks closer to this, but it's not quite there. It's not quite there. You could see, for instance, if I had, say, 5 lots of this and uh, 5 lots of this. Right? I could take out a common factor, yeah? So I would have five lots of this. Now, if that were true, what would be really nice is, I know that number is divisible by three. Can you see why? Think about it. This number that I've written on the bottom, I know it's divisible by three because it's five times a number I've assumed is divisible by 3. Well, if, if you've got some number like, say, say this, if you multiply it by 5, it'll still be divisible by 3. If you multiply it by 18, it'll still be divisible by 3. Does that make sense? Because um, once you've already got that divisibility property, you can multiply by any integer you like. Okay? Now, I don't have 5s here and here. I don't have the same number. I've got a 7. I've got to take away 4. Okay? So I'm going to, again, use a bit of imagination and see how I can fiddle with this. I want the same number in both instances. I want the same number. You got 7 here, you got 4 here. But 7 has 4 baked into it, isn't it? Right? 7 is just, uh, I'm going to need more fingers. 7 is just our shorthand for 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. Plus 1. And that's a, a pain to say, so we just say 7, right? But can you see that 3 is hiding in here? Where's 3? If you just take these guys and put them off to the side, here's 3, right? So 3 is inside 7. If I just tease it apart a little bit, it's very obvious, right? Watch. Um, how many did I say was left over? If I take away 3 of them, I said 4, didn't I? Because that's 4. If I take away 3 of them, what's left behind? There are 4. Do you agree? Like this is just, I've just broken it apart. Let me highlight it for you. This guy, I've just chopped it into two pieces. Okay? But this is an improvement. Can you see why? Because look, now I have this situation, which is just like what I have over here. I can factorize. Three lots of this, that's, that's three, that's important, plus four lots of this.
Okay. I'm almost there. Are the gears turning for you yet? Have a look at what's going on here, right? See this number here? What do I know about it? What have I assumed about this number? I've assumed this number is divisible by three, right? So therefore, this whole thing, when you multiply it by four, it's still divisible by three. Do you agree? Does that make sense? What about this guy? What do you know about this guy? It has to also be divisible by three because look, it's three times, who cares what this is? It's three times something that's a whole number, okay? So I'm gonna make this a little more obvious by substituting in what I assume to be true, okay? So this is four lots of three P by assumption. This phrase here that I'm just writing on this side here is a really important phrase. If you want to be um, really fancy and sound, you know, technical and impressive, you could say by the inductive hypothesis, which is a fancy way of saying, hey, this is the thing I assume to be true, right? Uh, it's inductive because it's part of a proof by mathematical induction. It's a hypothesis because, what is a hypothesis? Yeah, it's an idea and you're like, I'm not sure if it works, but let's just try it on and see what happens, okay? So now I can factorize out one more time because everything is a multiple of three. Do you agree? That's this, seven to the k plus four p. This is what I was after, right? Because see this guy, it's gotta be a whole number, right? It's made up of all these whole number pieces. So this is three q where Q equals this guy. Are you happy? So what have I achieved? Let's stand back and look at the entire thing. Need a bit of space, sorry. What I've achieved is, I know if there's some value where this thing works, right? then you can show that it works for the next value. Does that make sense? I don't know what this value is. Remember, I just assumed it. I don't actually know that it's true. But if there's some value, suppose it's true for k being 100. That means I can use that fact to prove it for 101. But if it's true for 101, that means it's true for 102 as well. And if it's true for 102, that means you can use that fact to prove it for 103. And so on forever, right? Does that make sense? So if it's true somewhere, anywhere, it will be true for all the subsequent numbers because that's what this proof shows us, okay? But hold on, hold on. I actually know I proved properly that it's true for the first value. You see that? That was the very first thing that we did, right? So if it's true for this first value, then this is true for k equals one, which means it's true for k equals two. But if it's true for two, then I can use that to prove it true for three. If it's true for three, then four, four, then five, for every positive integer. Does that make sense? Now, everything I just said, um, <laughs> when I was in school and I had to do this topic, um, I had to basically give you that, that maybe 40, 50 words I just said, you had to include that as a little paragraph underneath all of this writing. And then we were like, as HSC markers, we thought that's really bad. We're just making people write the same thing over and over again. It's very long. So all you guys have to do is say, therefore, proven by the principle of mathematical induction. You might feel like, oh, that's a lot of words. Well, we used to colloquially call the paragraph that you had to write into this, we used to call it the essay, right? And you have to memorize all of the steps in it and you have to produce the whole thing. And really what we're trying to understand and, and get you to demonstrate is all this stuff, not that paragraph at the end. So that's why all you have to do is write that phrase, okay?